and then I could go ahead and start because I'm going to start with the wait, bios wait, wait. first. You're live. You're live. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Black Male Initiative Task Force um, second um, Tong Hall. Um, thank you for joining us this um, afternoon. As you would have received in your announcement, this session, th these sessions would be will occur in two segments. The first is the live session which we are in, which will go until 2 p.m. And then following that, we will have the uh, meeting where we will be hearing um, some um, critical feedback from you as well. I do want to apologize for one of our scheduled um, panelists, um, Dr. Um, Lopez uh, Matthews. He had an emergency, so he would not be able to join us um, this afternoon. But I'm pleased that the others are able to join us. And I first would like to um, introduce the four panelists who will be sharing with you this afternoon. Let me begin by introducing Dr. Um, John Hudgens, who is no stranger to most of us. And Dr. Hudgens has a unique set of integrated experiences in both public and private settings, effectively responding to institutional challenges in program design, higher educational leadership instruction, research, and human services administration. Dr. Hudgens received his PhD in sociology from Duke University, a master's of arts also in sociology from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And he also holds a certificate from Russ College um, an administrative academy for the HBCU faculty and did additional studies at Shaw University Divinity School in Raleigh, North Carolina. Dr. Hudgens has had extensive leadership experience, which includes, but not limited to, being the co-director um, Collaborative ma on a collaborative master's degree program in human services administration between Coppin State University and the University of Baltimore, and this has been in place since 1999. Served as a project director for Maryland Suicide Prevention, a sub-award between the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and Coppin State University and he served as the, de the chair of the Department of Applied Social and Political Sciences from 1993 to 2013, as well as the interim chairperson of the Department of Criminal Justice from 2003 to 2006. He also served as the executive coordinator at Hampton, Hampton University Black Family Institute from 1998 to 1993. As far as his instructional experience relative to Black males and Black families are concerned, Dr. Hudgens has presented on topics focusing on responding to the redefinition of gender roles in the global economy, um, a presentation he did in Barbados, a presentation on the strengths of Black families and well-being, the role of the Black church and Black back Black Family Solutions, The Black Economy of Black Male Marginality, as well as the impact of Black Male Marginality on, the, on Black Family Survival and Achievement within the system. So you see that Dr. E um, Hudgens has had extensive experience relative to the topic that we will be discussing. We're also pleased to have um, Professor Susan Fetchel. Professor Fetchel is the coordinator of clinical training in the Department of Psychology and Counseling and Behavioral Health. Professor Fetchel is a licensed clinical professional counselor 
a state board approved clinical supervisor and a nationally certified approved clinical supervisor. She has more than 25 years of experience in providing individual and family counseling in schools, nonprofits, and private practice, as well as providing supervision and consultation to other professionals and graduate student interns. She is a certified compassion fatigue educator and compassionate compassion fatigue therapist. She holds a master's in pastoral counseling from Loyola University and is currently pursuing a PhD in counselor education and supervision. The third panelist I would like to introduce to you is Mr. Christopher Thomas. Mr. Thomas is the Assistant Director of the Center for Counseling and Student Development at Coppin State University. He received a Bachelor of Science degree from the illustrious Howard University and a Master's of Social Work degree from the University of Maryland at Baltimore. As a psychotherapist committed to learning and professional growth, he is an active member of the Higher Education Case Manager Association and the American College of Counseling Association. Mr. Thomas is an active member of the psychotherapy community as a fellow and faculty member of the International Psychotherapy Institute, the Metro chapter. He has organized local and national conferences in various roles, including case presenter, discussant, and conference chair on topics related to slavery, black boys, and trauma. Related conferences include the breadth and depth of slavery's wounds and black boys in the eyes of the storm. Developing clinical and educational development tools that promote contextual understanding and resilience is a driving force in his work both on and off campus. It's awkward to introduce myself, but I, I will give a brief introduction to who Dr. Errol Sebastian Bolden is. I am a professor and past chair in the Department of Social Work at Coppin State University. I serve as a senior part-time lecturer at the Cable campus of the University of West Indies in Barbados, and as a visiting um, professor at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, where I now work primarily with doctoral students on their dissertation and research. I have over 23 years of experience as a macro practitioner, and my research agenda focuses on community and organizational capacity building, university community partnerships, faith-based community development, the globalization of higher education, as well as on disengaged dads and disengaging of me and on the disengaging of males in the academy. Um, I moved to the United States in 1984, pursuing my undergraduate degree in social work at Northwest Nazarene University in Nampa, Idaho. I have a master's degree in social work from Howard University and a master's degree in public health as well as my PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. I also serve as um, work as an author of child and adult inspirational um, books, do some motivational speaking as well as game development and the owner of Universal Inspirations. And I am a certified grief recovery um, specialist. So, at this point in time, we're going to transition after you now have a good sense of who we are um, into some um, brief um, introduction. I'm sorry, some brief, brief presentations, some four minute, minute presentations by each of the um, panelists. We will be talking about um, capturing the concerns and responsibilities of male students at Coppin, which has been and continue to be an uphill battle. But what I will do first is I will first turn over to um, Professor um, Fetchel 
who will um, start off our presentation, then I will come back and share with you. And then we'll have a presentation followed um, by um, Mr. Thomas, and then we we'll lead right to the last presentation by Dr. John Hudgens. Professor Fetchell. Thank you, Dr. Bolden. And good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to give you a few, just a very few statistics. Um, according to University System of Maryland's latest statistics, Coppin's gender breakdown is uh, roughly 77% female and 23% male. Um, and I know other, other panelists are going to talk a bit more about that. Of uh, the students awarded degrees in spring of 2019, we had about the same, about 23% male and 77% female. So although we are skewed in terms of gender, um, the male student success rate in terms of completion is, um, is on target for the percentage that they represent. So, so that's good news. One observation that we might make from this information is that the, our male students have chosen this minority serving institution and then they get here and turns out they are a clear minority here on campus. So a different type of minority, but a minority just the same. And as, as faculty, we all see this in our classrooms. So we're, we're certainly aware of, of the numbers, but do we, do we really keep it in the front of our minds what it means to be uh, in the minority to that degree here at Coppin? And do we keep in mind what these students might need in order to feel supported and valued in this environment? And I, I think that's one of the things that we want to talk a bit about today. Almost 20 years ago, the Justice Policy Institute released a report that yielded a quote that I know we've all heard, and that is, there are more black males in prison than in college. Since that time, we've heard that quote many times from um, athletes, celebrities, you know, people who are social justice minded and, and well intended, um, even from then Senator Barack Obama uh, when he was running for president the first time. Um, I've certainly heard it. I know you've heard it as well, and I expect that our students have heard that. Um, probably by some well-intentioned person who was trying to motivate them in some way. The fact is, however, that statistic is not true. It is not true that there are more black males in prison than in college. It's definitely not true now when the, the reality is there are over 600,000 more black males in college than in prison. Say that again, over 600,000 more. Um, and it probably wasn't true in 2002 when it was first published either. And I think Dr. Hudgens is going to say more about um, skewed statistics and the way black males are represented. Um, but if our students have heard that and they think it's true, and if they believe that we believe that about them, that's going to complicate the student faculty relationship. That kind of repeated statistic can um, affect the way our students see themselves, um, and we have to be mindful not to let such disinformation color our own perspectives, our expectations, and our hopes for our students. One statistic I've encountered that I, that I do think is worthy of consideration is regarding the trauma history of students. In 2013, a study of over 500,000 African-American college students was conducted. It was both males and females. 74% of those students reported having experienced at least one traumatic event in their lives up to that point. And two thirds of them reported having experienced more than one, multiple traumatic events. The most frequently reported traumatic event was losing a loved one to violence in some form. The events reported by males in particular were things like experience some kind of life-threatening accident, being the victim of crime like a robbery, a mugging, an assault, being threatened with a weapon, being present when another person they knew was, was killed or assaulted, and other experiencing um, serious injuries or, or perceived threat to their lives. 
So if we're encountering students who've experienced these kinds of life events, and there's a good chance that we are, and some of them may still be living in situations where there are threats like this still present, it's important for us to be trauma-informed as educators and to know what kinds of supports we might be able to provide to help our students succeed. So I know we're all gonna be talking a lot more about how to help our students succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor um, Fetchell. As I alluded to when and um, that we are facing an uphill battle, and I'm just going to show you a few slides. We will discuss some of the content a little later on that um, helps you to understand why I'm saying that we are facing an uphill battle. If we look at the um, the statistics as far as the top 10 HBCUs with the least gender parity, you will be able to see where um, we um, Coppin State University fall. Um, sometimes, uh, quite often, you know, it is kind of sad to see us at the bottom as far as the gender parity is concerned. But I, but we need to be concerned about this, not because we have how the numbers look, but the impact of those numbers. The next slide um, shares some information as to why. Um, the men are, are, are falling behind. Well, the first one um, is one that is more widely understood or uh, accepted um, in that the thinking is that there's less interest in school, but also the cost and skills gap is another issue that has been highlighted. Continuing with our focus as to why this is an uphill um, battle as the next slide will um, articulate. When we talk about um, interest in school, there's less of a preparation for college. Fewer men aspire to go to college. Um, male high school students are must, much less likely to look up information about college, and men place less value on college than women, questioning whether it's necessary or whether the cost is worth um, the benefit. Next slide shows. The, um, the whole discussion about the money it costs to go to college. And you, you may ask yourself, is it, isn't it the same for um, men as it is for um, women? But you uh, must also keep in mind that um, a high school graduate who is male um, would make significantly more in, in several cases than a high school graduate um, who is um, female. And so when you look at that cost and, and what they may make relative to the person who is in college, that also sometimes serves as a de deterrent. Some researchers have also suggested that college um, and education is simply geared more towards um, what they describe as quote unquote feminine um, traits. And we can talk a little bit more about that later. The next slide then introduces to some key concerns regarding the gender parity. When men graduate from um, college, they have a higher impact on their economy and lesser unemployment. So that's a, um, a key reason why we are uh, again pushing the whole notion of getting more males into the academy. There's greater gender parity with college enrollment um, can lead to uh, financial trade-offs for men down the line. The educational disparity is bad for marriages. And there are a lot of texts that um, talk about the whole notion of women feeling that they have to marry down, right? Because the men are not as, as educated as they are. And quite often that increases the likelihood of the uh, marriage ending in divorce. Um, this other one, and I highlighted this um, in particular, um, because it is something that we, I don't think, always pay close attention to, but we need to be mindful um, of. And when I was doing my research, the study pointed out that the gender imbalance um, at HBCU, which has been published in the Journal of AIDS Care in 2006, found that primary consequences of this gender racial imbalance were men having multiple female sexual partners during the same period and women 
um, are more likely complying with men's um, condom use um, preference, which is no condom use, um, because the, um, the pool is not very um, big. The gender parity can also enhance an institution's ability to offer a wider range of athletic um, programs. And the last one I want to highlight is that the path to um, college gender gaps begins before college. And that is something that um, really reminds us that our efforts um, should not um, start at college, but prior to college. Thank you, let's um, transition on now to the presentation um, from Mr. Chris Thomas. Hi, good afternoon. So I'm going to make a few uh, comments about kind of my lens in the counseling center and kind of uh, the um, issues that are confronting our males on on campus and some strategies that we can use in response to that. So one thing that we have to remember is uh, is is that is that it's important to kind of shift right to reframe some of the um, experiences that our students have overcome. Um, so Dr. Juwanta Kondrufu, um, a number of years ago, um, did some research and wrote a book called Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys, where he talked about the shift that happens in third grade, where uh, black boys become, begin to be, be tracked in essence, right? And so he talked about the absence of, uh, of, of male teachers and the prevalence of black males to be in special ed. And so the students who, are, who have arrived here on campus have encountered a lot. And I think it's important to remember that and also make a shift to reframe that uh, from uh, a little less of a deficit model and more towards a strength model. Being here on campus, registering, signing up, showing up is important. And so we need to remember that students have overcome a lot and use that as a strength to continue to overcome the other challenges that will uh, be placed in, in front of them as they matriculate throughout throughout uh, the throughout school. It's also important to remember um, our, our role and our purpose. Right? And so if we can see students through that lens, if we can see students, um, see a little bit of ourselves in our students uh, and create that uh, that humbleness, uh, I think, you know, that reminds us of, of our purpose here on an HBCU. If we can connect those two things, that can be really helpful to drive a student towards, towards graduation and overcome challenges towards, towards graduation. The other um, point that I want to make is about checking in, checking in. And so being able to check in on a regular basis, letting a student know that, that you see yourself in them, they're here for a reason, there's a purpose, there's an end goal. That sort of checking in process can be really helpful. It can be helpful during projects big and small. It can be helpful from semester to semester, from class to class. That sort of checking in process can be it can be a, a, a life-saving for, for students. It can make the difference of graduating and not graduating. Checking with students who, who may disappear for what have you, whatever reason, you know. Letting know know that they matter, that they're here for a reason, is critically important. Developing, uh, helping students develop a sense of self-efficacy, right, is also pretty important. They they have the ability, right, and because they have the ability, we set certain expectations. We set certain expectations, knowing that they can and will produce, and so that's what we expect is them to produce. Building that up is, is incredibly important for, for students who may be uh, faced with challenges that are different. College is different, expectations are different, um, adjusting to lots of unknowns is different. So building that self-efficacy is, is incredibly, incredibly important. Integrating the, the, revel, the relevance of school in a growth mindset kind of point of view is also pretty important, right? Um, their effort is what's going to to make the difference, right? Um, it's not about someone being kind of born with some sort of magical kind of uh, intellectual ability, but it's their effort that will produce the difference. And therefore, they can always um, they can always put forth effort to do to do well in school. It's these sorts of things that I think will make an incredible difference in the 
in the in the college life of our of our black male students. So I want to highlight those today and we'll continue to talk about these and other factors in the remainder of the presentation. So thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Um, Thomas. Um, now we will transition on to the presentation from Dr. John Hudgens. Dr. Hudgens. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here and to talk about this topic. It's one that's very dear to my heart. And fortunately, we have had some effort at Coffin for the last almost 20 years trying to address that concern. We kind of been up and down, but basically we've had some attention to the issue. I want to talk a little bit about faculty student relationships and uh, hopefully I won't get hopefully I won't be too redundant and maybe we'll come back to some of the issues. Uh, the first challenge would be the two myths that Professor Fetcho mentioned. Uh, and I just wanted to add to that the current numbers, or at least the numbers that Mr. Tos, Dr. Tolson is giving now, and it's of 2013, there were 1.4 million black men in college compared to about 840,000 black men uh, in prison. And as you know, there have been some efforts to reduce the prison numbers. So hopefully that number looks better and hopefully the college numbers have gone up. The other one is the myth, and it's not really a myth, it's the perception at Happen that there are more women involved in higher education than black men. So therefore, we tend to look at the black male as kind of a rarity. Well, as Dr. Bolin kind of pointed out, uh, Coppin is at the top of the list. I just want to share with you a couple of other numbers, though. Uh, when we look at our sister institutions, however, 38% of the students at Bowie are male, 42% at UMIS are male, and just about 42% at Morgan are male. When you look at the USM as a whole, and these numbers are critical, 10% of the enrollment in the whole United U University System of Maryland, uh, University System of Maryland, 10% of those are black men, compared with 14% black females. Again, the numbers are very close. The overall enrollment, this is black, white, and everything else in USM, 48% are male and 52% are females. So it suggests that the imbalance we see at Coppin is a serious one, but it does not represent the national, even a statewide picture. When you look nationally in 2018, 33% of black males ages 18 to 24 were enrolled in post-secondary education compared with 41% of black females. So again, nationally, we're looking at some level of parity. Now, there are a lot of variations in that, but I think the point here is to help our young men not feel like somehow they are some rare breed. And I think as, as Professor Fetcho mentioned, sometimes we begin to lower the bar, you know, that you did great just to get to college because there's so many of you are in jail or someplace else. So trying to get past that. Uh, the next point I want to make is to talk about the impact of, for us and for many other campuses as well, the impact of, of young males being outnumbered in the classroom. Uh, the first thing we get is something that Elijah Anderson called many years ago, the cool pose. And if you notice, like I do, they have a tendency to be quiet. They have a tendency to, to, a tendency to kind of look like they know what's going on, when in many cases they don't. They avoid the conversations or the discussions, and sometimes you have to pull them in. Well, Anderson pointed out that's kind of a black male defense me mechanism. If you stay quiet and look tough, people assume you're tough and that you are in charge. And when in reality, you may well not be, and I suspect in the case of many of our students, they're not. But there's this pose that the real man is this silent, strong individual. And that's not just unique to black folk, but it kind of is uh, overemphasized in many cases in our society and to our detriment. Uh, I often say to our young students that when white males are quiet, we assume that they know what's going on and they're otherwise uh, distracted. When black males are quiet, we assume they don't know what's going on, and therefore it's to their advantage to begin speaking up and be heard. The, other, the next uh, concern in classroom is the instructor relationships. Very often students will say to me especially, you remind me of my father. And I think the issue here is that we have to be careful that we separate instructor roles from parental roles. Uh, it's good to be reminded of the father, to be reminded of the mother, assuming that the relationship between the father and the mother was a good one. Okay, if I'm reminding you of the father that you hated because he or she was not there, or he was vicious, or because of the mother that you hated because she was very domineering, that doesn't work. So the concern here is that we are very careful that we don't inadvertently fall into 
mimicking adults that have been very destructive in their lives. And the best way to do that, of course, is to proceed with caution. If there is a student who embraces your kind of motherly or fatherly role and that's productive for that student, fine. But if it's a student that kind of bristles from that, that kind of draws back from that, then it should be kind of a wake up call that maybe that's not the way I need to proceed. And again, that's a little tricky with young black men because they're kind of clever and in the habit of masking their feelings. So you have to listen a little bit more carefully uh, in terms of what's going on. The next challenge is what I'm calling uh, feminism in the classroom. Uh, there is no question that this society, there's a lot of gender inequity uh, where women come up on the short end and there's a lot of male dominance. Remember that these young black men are not responsible for that. You know, they are in many ways sometimes not even aware of it. And I have obviously been in situations where I've seen female faculty uh, just take it out on a young black man because he says something stupid. Uh, and my thing is to recognize, you know, that 18 and 19 year olds and sometimes even older than that, part of the reason they're with us is to learn. So when they say stupid things, it's not an issue of chastising, it's a matter of correcting them. They are not the male chauvinist predators uh, that are really dominating the society. I can name a few, but it would might be politically correct to do that right now. Uh, but the bottom line is that that kid before us is in need of a tender, careful instruction to move him to where he needs to be, as opposed to being vicious about that. There are some issues with young male independence. One of the things that we see, in particular in the black communities, is this notion that we push our males out much earlier. There is a tendency in our society to think that men should mature quicker, particularly in terms of economics and independence, uh, but I think sometimes we kick them out. Uh, we push young men out and to, to determine that they need to be on their own, in many cases when they're not. In some cases, dad is in college. They're in college because they have no place else to go. Don't really want to be there. They're struggling to stay there, but they can't go back home or they can't go anyplace else. Many of them are living with relatives, they're living with friends, and a few of them are in fact homeless. Uh, and we can circle back to that in a minute. The other thing that we get sometimes, particularly in some female-headed households, is the illusion of malehood. You know, he spent his, her, his years since, you know, 10 years old, 12 years old, this is my little man, this is the man of the household, and without really having any concept of what that should mean. Now, obviously for the mom and the people saying that, that's metaphorically, but if there's not another balance for what that means, then he gets the kind of bravado in classroom that says, well, I'm a man, and we're kind of looking at, you know, where is that coming from? And of course, that makes a level of sensitivity uh, a kind of a thin skin where any little insult is a major insult. And in our cases, it can result in losing that student. Uh, the housing situation can become very challenging and we need to be uh, concerned about that. Another challenge to be concerned about is some of our male students are parents. We have a kind of a thing going, I haven't seen it officially, but generally we think about 60% of our students are parents. Uh, often we're thinking that they are the women students, but we have men students who are parents as well. And some of them are custodial parents and some of them are non-custodial parents. My concern has always been on what I've seen is that in many cases, the non-custodial parent happens to be much more problematic, particularly when there's a support agreement in and the relationship with the baby mama is not as good as they could be. They can really intrude in and disrupt life. Two things we need to be sensitive to, particularly when we have discussions in classrooms that border on those issues, is to kind of pay attention to see where the male students are chiming in. And sometimes it's not so much what they're saying, sometimes it's the body language, sometimes it's the absence, sometimes it's the not returning to class after we've had some of those conversations. And we have, unfortunately, in some situations, some female students who've had some very difficult uh, clashes and experiences with males. And we have to be very careful that they don't wind up taking it out on the few males that are present in the classroom because those males represent what may be in their mind all men. All men, men are different and we can't just put everybody in a class. I remember when I first started teaching and even as a young man growing up, I very often hear people say, you know, all men are dogs. And I used to kind of wonder, you know, why am I automatically considered to be a dog when you don't even know me? And I have made it a point of saying to students when they say stuff like that, you know, how many men do you actually know? Who are you actually talking about? 
And the reality is they talk about that one person that did them wrong, and then that has become a transparency to everybody else. Bottom line is we need to be sensitive to that. The other situation our students may face, some of them is the whole gang situation and the challenge that that presents. Now in Baltimore, we don't know whether we're talking about actual gangs or not. There are some actual gangs, but there are some gang wannabes. There are some posses. And sometimes it's just the kids you grew up with. The bottom line is that you may be getting some pressure because you are being different. You are, you are tracking along a different path. There may be some physical threats. I've had students talk about they got beat up on the way to campus. Students who are going through all kinds of changes to make sure that they blend in when they get back into the community. I had one student who we had a, a black male class. And, you know, I asked everybody to dress up on a particular day because I wanted people to get in the habit of doing that or think about that. Well, he came in and so we had to go to the uh, bathroom and change because he had put his dress shirt in his backpack and he was going to put that on when he came to class, but he needed to take it back off when he went back on the bus because when he got back in the hood, he needed to look like something else. And of course, I've seen young men coming on campus, pulling up their pants when they get off the bus and kind of loosening, letting them go back down when they got back on the bus because of the need to blend in. Now, some of this was harmless peer pressure, but some of it might have been a kind of a threat that they felt or that they had to acquiesce to. Um, last thing I want to throw, think about is that, and I think we've already alluded to that, is that the young men we get are survivors. They have survived, a, in some cases, a very brutal or hostile K-12 through experience, uh, which means that they have some strengths. They have some hopes. They have some dreams for themselves. And what we need to do is to take that seriously. They are not the guy on the street. They are not the gangbanger. They are not the hooligan. They are different. And we need to respect that difference, cherish it, and encourage it. Last thing is the whole notion of what that does, and I think Dr. Bolden alluded to it, what that means for the overall community. Yes, families with an unequal balance in terms of education are more likely to divorce, but families with two breadwinners are stronger families. Male, female families tend to be stronger, and the one demographic uh, that has closed the gaps between blacks and whites is the married couple, two people working. The gap between them and whites is the smallest economic gap we have in our society. The whole notion of wealth building is often, again, a team thing when there's a man and a woman, and I'm being very traditional in that, are working together to make things happen. And the last thing is what that does to the community. Uh, when you've got strong black men as well as strong black women and women in general uh, working together, it does wonders for the communities that we're building. HBCUs have contributed in very significant cases to middle, the black middle class. Oftentimes we're looking at two people who met in college and somehow became involved and went on to build their futures to build very strong futures. I notice that when I look at Coppin graduates, and I know a few of them, many of them are people who met at Coppin. They got married, they went on to build their families, um, and now they're, they're contributing in major ways to the society. So I'm going to stop right there. But again, the point being, uh, final point, as faculty members, we need to be very sensitive to our students and we need to listen, not only with our ears, but with our sensitivities. A lot of times young black men are not really telling us what's going on in their world and we need to find a way to get there and to be sensitive to the fact that there may be some things that we're not actually hearing or dealing with. Okay, okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Hudgens. Let's um, transition on to some of the questions that were posed by you um, when you registered, and I'm going to ask Mr. Chris Thomas if he would respond to this um, concisely. I want to remind the um, panelists that we um, are doing this until one o'clock and then we're going to have another session um, following where um, we could elaborate on some things. So the first question I would like to pose is, was presented to us and it says, with the spotlight on black males and people of color, what positive changes have you seen so far? That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, what would you like to see occurring now? Mr. Thomas, would you please respond to that? Yeah, well, sure. So I, I appreciate the question um, first. So I think the positive changes that I've seen uh, so far are students who are really interested in doing something. 
uh, students who are here with a, a clear purpose um, and a goal, right? And so they're here with, the, and so they remember that as they kind of matriculate throughout school, right? And so students who have uh, goals and dreams of entrepreneurship, of, of, of jobs, doing uh, something in their field, and students who really have a, a real strong desire of school, to, to do well in school. Um, school is relevant, uh, they have a real purpose in school. Um, the, the second part of that question was about, what's the second part of that question? The second um, part what, of that part, what would you like to see occurring now? Yeah, yeah. So what I would like to see occur now is uh, is more uh, representation and leadership on campus, um, whether it be student government or otherwise, uh, in terms of student clubs. I think leadership is, is a great opportunity to create a bridge from uh, college life to the workforce um, as students uh, begin to enter the workforce and begin to do things that uh, that create that transition. Uh, things like uh, networking, things like kind of putting yourself out there, right? It takes a lot to kind of put yourself out there uh, when things aren't necessarily so clear. Um, and so putting yourself out there to kind of figure things out, uh, building up that uh, that sense of uh, um, accomplishment, I think is a, is a, is a great um, factor that's kind of part of leadership, I think, on campus and will transition into the, uh, into the workforce. Thank, thank you so very much. Another question that's um, posed that I would first ask um, Professor Fetchko to respond to is how can faculty and staff best support black males at um, enrolled at Coppin? And then I'll ask um, Dr. Hodgins if he can give a brief response to that as well. Professor Fetchko. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Bolden. I think that's that's part of why we're all here is because we want to understand how to do a better job of that. So I'm thinking about some of the things that have been mentioned about um, negative stereotypes and, and what Mr. Thomas mentioned coming from a deficit perspective. And I think we need to be on the lookout for that all the time and be able to talk back to that and, and really come from a strengths perspective, as Mr. Thomas mentioned. So um, we want to invite students to, to take a, a discerning look at how they're portrayed in, in media, whether it's in the news or, or in film or whatever, and, and ask them how they feel about that and how would they portray black males differently? Um, because in fact, they can, you know, they can, they can create, they can make news, they, you know, they can succeed. So they, they have the ability um, over time, certainly, and, and with our support to change stereotypes. And I would invite them to look for positive role models. Um, another thing that, that Dr. Hudgens alluded to is um, our responses to black males in class. I, I know we, we're all familiar with microaggressions in terms of, of race, but there are microaggressions in terms of gender as well. And sometimes I think we might let them slide, like um, the, the comment that all men are dogs. Um, you know, we want to empower all of our students to respond to things that are microaggressions and, and how do you respond to that in a way that's effective and not hostile and I think um, you know that's that's something that's a skill that we can help all of our students build um, but it, it particularly comes to the forefront maybe in a class where there are you know 20 women and and two men probably too often we've kind of laughed that off or just let it slide and that's one of the things I think we can do, just help them strategize how to respond to stereotypes and microaggressions. Thank you, uh, Professor Fetchel. Um, Dr. Hodgins, you addressed some of it in your presentation um, just now, but is there anything else you would like to add in response to um, what we can do? Well, I think that the major thing we have to do is to make it a priority. Um, I think one of the things that you kind of said in passing was that our education systems, and I know we talk about it all the time in sociology especially, education is very feminine oriented. Uh, girls could do food, as a matter of fact pointed out, that our girls early on get the skills they need to succeed in, in, in education, K through 12 especially, but boys don't. I mean, they learn to read earlier, they are much more verbal, uh, they smell better, they are cute, all of those things play into at least, you know, elementary school and on. Um, so what happens is 
boys find themselves in an environment that's really not that welcoming to them. Uh, again, as I said, those that we see have made it through at least some of that. So we need to just be mindful of their presence. We need to be really concerned about them in the future, and we need to find ways to say it and show that. Uh, I think the critical thing is that because girls tend to be very adept at this environment, they become easy. I mean, when girls need help, they're taught to ask for it. You know, Dr. Hudson, I don't understand this. This paper don't make no sense. Boys are taught, or at least not taught that, and they wind up being quiet. You know, I remember having a kid, I think when I was at Hampton, might have been earlier, I wonder why he kept taking the same class and failing the class. And I would reach out to him, please come in and talk with me about it. Things that are going on. I had a lot of things I wanted him to do in terms of changes, his papers and all that. He never would come in. Eventually he would, he dropped the class. But the point is somewhere along the way, help seeking was not a part of what he needed to do. So we need to be mindful of that, find a way to show it, and I think be very cognizant of the nonverbals. Right, in, in a book that I think I would like us to discuss at some point in time on campus, because the title is very provocative, it's called uh, The um, End of Men. And one of the things that the authors advance is that um, the reason why so many men are falling behind is that women are simply more adaptable, uh, whether by nature or because of flexibilities they are allowed by cultural norms. And I think um, you spoke to some of that in your um, in your comments. But another question that was um, posed that I'm going to um, come back to you, um, Mr. Thomas, to address is how do we build self-efficacy um, of our students? How do we build that? Yeah, I appreciate that. So self-efficacy is really important, obviously, in college and just kind of in general, right? So coming to an environment where things are new, um, policies, procedures are new, um, bureaucracy is new, uh, relationships are new inside the classroom, outside the, outside the classroom. So there's a lot kind of going on along with and on top of um, academic, right, uh, academic, um, you know, requirements. So there's a lot to adjust to. There's a lot to feel uncomfortable about, frankly, you know. And so this is a, an incredible important skill um, to, 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 to hone, to get good at. And so I think one strategy to, to do that um, is to, to balance, I think, two things that are important. To balance push and encourage, push and encourage. I think men want to do well. They, they, they want to feel this, you know, tough. Um, they want to feel strong. They want to, uh, they want to accomplish and conquer things, right? Men just naturally kind of want to do that. Um, so pushing, pushing students um, to, 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 to um, pushing students to challenge themselves. All right, we're not going to take the easy way out because no one, no one feels good about doing. No one feels good when taking the easy way out. People feel good when they, when they conquer something. People feel good when they stretch. You know, that's what makes people feel good. So to challenge students, right, to not, not make things easy because no one wants that. No one wants sympathy, right? And also to reward and encourage them, right? All along the way, at every step along the way, you know? So they're there, they're here with a purpose. Um, you're gonna raise the bar and they're gonna meet the bar, right? You know, um, encouraging them, encouraging them um, by checking in with them on a regular basis, um, not allowing students to check out, right? Um, sometimes uh, we get in the habit of kind of ignoring students, frankly. Um, a student is, is in class and they're really not focused and really have other things that they would like to be doing with their time. And sometimes we kind of let them do other things with their time, you know? And and we and we engage in this in the silent, in the silent um, uh, conspiracy which says, I won't bother you if you won't bother me, right? You don't act up and I won't bother you. So this is like silent conspiracy, you know, which which at the end isn't helpful, right? And so um, so and, and that's another way to uh, to challenge a student, I think, to to be quote in their face, you know, and also to encourage them along the way. So balancing pushing and encouraging, I think, is a great way to build uh, to build self-efficacy. And continuing, to, um, I'm going to ask you to also respond to this other um, question that was posed 
what are some effective engagement strategies that can be used to foster healthy interactions um, with black males at CSU? And I, 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 I know we are largely focusing on the, um, the faculty, but if you see anything interaction with the faculty, if you see anything as far as um, in your work or from your experience that would um, be a good strategy to adopt, not only for the interaction with the faculty, but also with the staff. Because keep in mind that um, a lot of the, um, the students um, complain about some of the challenges that they encounter um, with staff. And so this session was only was also to include staff. So speak to, um, to that as well. Yeah, so engagement is, is, is incredibly important, right? Because it answers the question about why is this relevant, right? It answers the relevance of school question, right? Which is incredibly important when you look at persistence, persistence towards, towards graduation. And that question is answered by both faculty and staff, right? So I think it's it's um it it doesn't really make sense really to 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 look at it from from one particular lens because the truth are there are lots of relationships across campus faculty and staff and otherwise right and so um and so they all need to be healthy engaging relationships right um so i, I think the idea of a mattering i think on campus is also important uh in response to this question um and so um like picking out something of um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interaction with somebody that is incredibly um, important and significant to them, remembering something uh, about them uh, that is significant, because uh, that answers the question that they do matter. That answers the question um, about um, being an ID number, one, three, five, seven, three, Sue, right, versus a particular person, right, who does matter, right? And I think, um, um, you know, seeing people across campus, you know, um, uh, engaging them in, in, in line at, at Subway, you know, um, uh, or otherwise is, is incredibly important. Um, asking them questions about what they're doing, why they're here, what they, they want to do, you know, to to encourage them to start that networking process um, early from from day one. You know? um, I think e eating lunch, something as simple as eating lunch with a student, you know, uh, is also incredibly engaging. Again, you matter. I'm singling out you. You uh, you are important. You're significant, right? Um, and it also starts that relationship process, which is like I said, is incredibly important. So some you know kind of simple strategies to start that engagement process. Yes. Let me go, um, Professor Fetchel. I'm coming to you, and this is not a um, this is a question from someone who just sent it in this morning, but um, I'd like to pose this question um, to you and ask also. Dr. Hudgens, if he can chime in on, on this. The question is, what are some of the ways that we can bridge the communication gaps between black males and those who love them in an effort to support collective and forward movement? Let me repeat it. What are some of the ways that we can bridge the communication gap between black males and those who love them in an effort to support collective and forward movement. Professor Fetchel. Thank you, Dr. Bolden. That is a challenging question. I think the first, probably the first thing that comes to mind is with their families, but, but in this setting, I think, you know, those who love them are those who are gathered here today and, and in our audience. Um, so how do we bridge that communication gap? One of the things I think we do is let them know that uh, the term that comes to mind is professors are people too. Um, but whether it's faculty or staff, I think it's interacting with a mutual level of respect and the, the understanding that what the student has to say or the perspective that they have is just as important as as my perspective is. Um, and I think that has to be communicated over and over again that I value you. I have respect for you. Um, and sometimes it's it's more challenging than than other times that I don't know if this example is relevant, but it just came to mind. So I'll share. Um, I was in, in class one evening and um, I happened to be in a classroom where the door was locking automatically when it when it would close. 
I didn't intend to lock a student out, but that's that's what happened. So the student came to the door and was very distraught and cursing and calling me everything but a child of God because I locked them out. And, um, you know, I just calmly went to the door, you know, having the perspective that this this isn't about me. This student doesn't know me for one thing, and I didn't lock him out for another thing. Um, but it does have to do with somewhere, sometime that student felt locked out. And so, you know, I opened the door and I smiled and I said, welcome and, and their name, you know, as I would have had the student arrived on time. So um, it was really interesting to sort of see the wheels turning in, in the student's head after that. And later, you know, came to me and said, I don't know if you heard what I was saying, but I, you know, and, and apologized. And I didn't even say, oh, yeah, I heard you call me a so and so. Um, you know, I just I commended them for um, coming to me and saying that. So I, I think those kinds of equal footing, personal interactions build a foundation for communication. Thank you, Dr. Hodgins. Do you have anything that you want to add to that? Because I have another powerful question coming up for you. OK, I just have a couple of things I want to add, and I just want to piggyback on some of what uh, Mr. Thomas was saying. Uh, one of the things I thought about was, you know, how we grade people. And, um, you know, a lot of times we blame black students, especially for not being able to write. And my thing is that grading should always be formative and not punitive. And I try very hard when I grade a paper to find something to have a positive comment about, uh, as well as the constructive and things I want to change. The other thing in terms of communication, though, is I also found that when I give papers that are much more open ended that require students to build in their personal experiences, it often gives me an opportunity to start a dialogue in my comments. You know, when somebody would say something about, you know, my father left at an early age, yada, yada, I will have some comment related to that and, you know, commend them for carrying on, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of opens the door for some students to do that. Another thing which I work on, which is I, I really have a problem with, but I work on, and that's speaking to strangers. You know, when you get on the elevator and there's a student that you don't know, do you speak to them? And sometimes I find I have to force myself to do that because normally I'm in my own little world, but part of having them be welcome here is to simply say, good morning, how are you doing? Good to see you. How's it going? How's the semester going for you? Those kind of things, I think, kind of welcome people and make them a uh, part of being here. Uh, to create assignments that, again, as I said, involve people, to write notes that are involving people. Uh, I often, uh, very often, I tell students, you know, that a lot of grading is arbitrary. We don't like to admit that. But I always say, you know, the difference between a B minus and uh, C plus is arbitrary. And if you got a student who's made a 78 in terms of how you calculated the paper, what do you do? And sometimes I say, well, if I give them a B minus, it's kind of an incentive. Whereas if I give them a C plus, it's a disincentive. So I'm saying, you're not where you want to be, but I see you moving in the right direction. And I think the reality is that's the benefit of the doubt that many students get. White males get it tremendously. We assume that when they fall short, it was a mistake. When a black student falls short, especially a black male, we assume that's the best he could do. Not that he's almost had a B, but he barely got past the C, so I'm gonna give him a C plus. Uh, and again, I think those little nuances and trends where we kind of take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis, we can begin changing them and create an environment where they feel comfortable to, to one, keep coming back, and therefore to keep trying. Thank you, um, Dr. Um, Hudgens. I, I know this other question may have some political um, ramifications, but I, I know that you will respond to it in the manner that um, is appropriate. The question that, that is posed is, what type of support and outreach um, will the Black Male Initiative Task Force provide to students at the Coppin Academy and Frederick Douglass High School? Ah, uh, yeah, I don't see that as political, but it, it's kind of sensitive. One, in that uh, I think we've made some overtures, and I'm saying as an institution, uh, I don't think they have been effective. I think we need to do more. Uh, obviously, the virus is an issue right now, but, you know, Douglas is in our backyard. Coffin Academy is on our yard. And the fact that there are young Black men in both of these situations, as well as Black females, as a matter of fact, or Black women, uh, 
I don't think we reached out enough. I think, you know, if we're going to be serious about creating that pipeline that Dr. Ballard talked about a long time ago, we have to be very constructive at doing that. And I think some of the things we need to do is to involve the faculty. All too often, the outreach efforts are made by administrators, vice presidents in particular. I think we need to find ways to get our faculty members in those classrooms, get those students in our classrooms. Um, I often thought, and I never got involved in it, but you know, the whole athletic thing, uh, I know we got some issues with NCAA, but the fact that we have the uh, club football team, there's no reason they couldn't practice over at, at Douglas from time to time. There's no reason we couldn't involve those kids in coming to those games because the games are free anyway, but having them be involved, you know, just to invite the football team, give them a special seat uh, on the bleachers for one of our games, to do all kinds of things to say, you know, these are our little brothers and sisters across the street. Now, they may not come to cop, and many of them will, but I think we got to be welcoming. Uh, many years ago, I was concerned, you know, that Towson camped right over there. Towson put a program in the Douglas, and they were in and out of there doing all kinds of things. Hopkins has been in and out of there doing all kinds of things. Meanwhile, we come up to the red light, turn left, and pretend that the school is not over there. Uh, same thing with Coppin Academy, and I can go on with that. I know that we've had some issues, and we're on the verge of terminating that contract. Uh, I don't think that's something we ought to be doing, but then faculty didn't have a whole lot to say about it. Administrators kind of decided that, you know, we're wasting money, we're not doing this, we're not doing that. Uh, again, I think it's a golden opportunity, and we just need to sit down and find ways uh, to be very proactive. You know, we say we want black students, we say we want black males, but really we're not doing anything special to get them. Uh, and we just have to be concerned about doing that. Yes, um, thank you. I'm just going to give some um, closing comments because we have to be prepared to transition on, um, to the next um, segment. But responding to some questions as far as what um, we as a task force um, will be doing this year. As mentioned during the university week, I should say, um, our goal is to, in the spring, to introduce the uh, Black Experience course that has been developed by the task force. Um, we will continue our discussions that we have started with our sister institutions, the sister HBCUs, towards the um, uh, Black Male Conference. The task force will continue to provide trainings and, and workshops to increase the awareness um, as far as a lot of these issues are concerned. And I know we didn't talk um, a whole, uh, any uh, really about COVID-19 in this segment, but maybe we'll bring it up in the next um, segment because we are hearing some disturbing um, statistics as it relates to even more disturbing statistics as it relates to COVID-19 and our black males. We would be developing a repository and we'll be focusing on resource development. Those are a number of things. We will be sending out um, correspondences to the um, faculty um, letting you know about specific ways that you can get um, involved because we do welcome um, your support. We welcome the involvement of students, both males and females, um, as we not only as we fo re focus on reconvening the coffin uh, man, but even to work with us on the task force because one of our goals is to build um, student le leadership and providing these opportunities. Um, would be a way to contribute um, to student leadership. There have been, um, there are some other questions that I think we will um, get to in the other um, segment. And remember that we have the second segment because we want to hear from you. Yes, each of the panelists have some um, expertise as far as the subject matter is concerned, but we are very much aware that you as faculty and staff also have expertise that's quite relevant to what we are doing. And so um, we are about to end this live segment. And as we end this live segment, we ask you to, um, to go in. You would have received the invitation to join the Teams meeting. And so you'd have to close out of this live um, session and sign in under the Teams meeting. And so during that session, the focus would be more interactive. Ladies and gentlemen, in the event that you would not be joining us for the next segment, 
I want to thank you for registering. I want to thank you for your um, questions and your ongoing support of the task force. I look forward to seeing you as we sign off now in the other segment where we will hear from you. I thank you.